Good evening, everyone. Let's all stand together. Please take your hymnals. Turn to hymn 314, please. Hymn 314. We'll sing nothing but the blood. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth of 314, nothing but the blood. Verse 1. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Number two, for my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And on the last, this is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Uh, tonight, if you think of it, pray for Pastor. Um, seasonal allergies oh, going on. No so other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father, Amen. thank you so uh, much tonight, for if loving you think us. Of it, pray for Pastor. Thank you. That uh, is the blood that washes away our sins. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song Father, Amen. thank you May so much tonight for tonight loving us. For for you. Thank you, that uh, is the Lord, blood. Uh, we are here to wash away our sins. No, there found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song Father, Amen. thank you May so much tonight for loving us. For for you. Thank you, that is the blood. We are here to wash away our sins. No, there found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father, Amen. thank you May so much tonight for loving us. For for you. Thank you, that uh, is the Lord, blood. Uh, we are here to wash away our sins. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song, Father, thank you so much tonight for loving us. For for you. Thank you, that is the blood. We are here to wash away our sins. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus. Song, Father, Amen. thank you so May much tonight for loving us. Father, thank you that it's, it's, it's the blood which to be here. Here it washes away our sins. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song, Father, Amen. thank you so May much tonight for loving us. Father, thank you that it's the blood which to be here. Here it washes away our sins. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song, Father, Amen. thank you so much tonight for loving us. Father, pray that for the salvation of us. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song, Father, Amen. thank you so much tonight for loving us. Father, pray that for the salvation of us. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song, Father, Amen. thank you so much tonight for loving us. Father, pray that for the salvation of us. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Song, Father, thank you so much tonight for loving us. Father, pray that for the salvation of us. No other fountain I 
gospel, give him boldness, give him wisdom, and give him protection. And I pray uh, for Pastor Lejeune, who's away. I pray it help him with his allergies. And I pray uh, for the housing situation. Uh, so often when you hear stories of people who buy a house, they, uh, they have some unpleasant surprises after the fact, and I pray that wouldn't be the case. We pray for Rose's daughter, that she would have an easy delivery. You'd help her with that as they induce labor tomorrow. I pray you comfort Rose. We pray for Millie Doran. I pray she wouldn't be lonely. I know some people have been going out to see her. And I pray you bless her, God, and comfort her. We pray for Chase as you help him with his studies. I'm sure he's probably taking exams about now. Oh, it's getting that time in spring and I pray you'd help him through that and Lord um, every request on this list is important there's, there's probably many more that haven't been brought up and whatever needs this church has the individuals in this church I pray you'd meet them I pray you'd help us God and, and help us to be empty vessels that you could fill that you could use that you could steer help us to be willing to do your work. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your hymn books. One more time, stand with me. Hymn number 360, please. Let's all stand. Hymn number 360. There is a fountain. We'll sing the first, third, and fifth. Hymn number 360. a 
fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Number three, dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. On the last, when this poor list brings stammering tongue, lies silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. You may be seated. Our missionary letter tonight is from the Campania family, missionaries to Juarez, Mexico. Their prayer letter reads, Dear partners in ministry, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Violent crimes and homicides are on the rise again in Juarez, yet souls continue to be pulled out of the fire. Thank you for laboring together with uh, Sylvia and I to reach those precious souls. The jail ministry has become a great door of opportunity to reach drug addicts and alcoholics for Christ, many of which are teenagers. During the past three, three, week, three weeks, over 20 men have called upon Christ to save them. Not all that easy, one man threatened to kill me, and one young lady laughed with an eerie jesting as I preached to her. I continue to preach the gospel to about 50 law enforcement officers every week. I long for the day for a revival to break out among them. After preaching, I distribute chick tracts and John and Romans to everyone. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Our Mexican church has about 20 teenagers. The majority of them play in our church's uh, orchestra. Some play piano, others flute, violin, and guitar. We try to keep our teen activity spiritual. During the month of February, our teens did Muppet evangelism in the southeastern neighbor neighborhood of Sierra, Sierra Vista. About 90 people came and about, 90, and about 20 kids prayed to receive Christ. Our 15-year-old daughter, Becky, gave the class and the invitation. We are very proud of her. She is also giving Bible classes to kids during our Wednesday night King's Kids ministry with several other teens. On Saturday, March 4th, our teens went to an assistant living center for the elderly. Our teens sang, did Muppets, and shared Christ with about 20 adults, of which three of them received Christ as Savior. Our next big events are to reach kids with cancer. About in a 90 people hospital, came, where one of our 90, members and about 20 uh, kids Melda at work Christ. and a week long Our 15 year old daughter Becky kids, gave the class and adults at the invitation. Instrument. We are very proud of her. Launching out to she deeper also waters, giving Bible classes our to kids during our Wednesday night annual missions kids conference. ministry with several other teens. This year we had five different On Saturday, March 4th, our teens went to an assistant living Christ center for the elderly. And go. Our teens Several sang, teens reaffirmed their and commitments Christ with study about 20 adults in Bible college of after which graduating three of them high school. Christ as we also saw our faith promise our next big events are to reach kids with cancer. About 90 people hospital. came, and one of our members, and about 20 uh, kids, Melda at work, Christ. currency is 11,000 year old daughter. Last year, our church gave 158,000 pesos to over 28 missionaries. Currently, our church is involved in building a new auditorium to accommodate 250 people to new and two new classrooms. Any church, any church group interested in helping our is bienvenido, which is welcome. Please pray, number one, for our safety. Number two, God's blessing upon our music camp in April and our church, church's 10th anniversary in May. We are planning a full week of evangelism. And number three, 
a new card to replace my 98 Ford Explorer war vehicle. Number four, money for hip replacement for Sister Rosa Emma Salazar, a sweet, faithful member in our church. We appreciate your love, prayers, financial support, and letters of encouragement. Jim, Sylvia, Becky, and Danny Campagna. Let's bow for a word of prayer for them. Lord, thank you for the ministry uh, we get to support down in uh, Juarez, Mexico. We do pray for Jim, for Sylvia and Becky and uh, Danny Campagna, that you bless everything that um, they do. Lord, uh, thank you for the good results of salvation, of uh, different ministries being started there. Would you, Lord, continue the work? Would you continue uh, what's being done here? Uh, and thank you that, Lord, we get to have a part of what's uh, uh, being done here at, uh, uh, in Mexico. And, Lord, help us to continually and uh, even increase our giving to our missionaries. Lord, uh, bless our night in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Brother Mike, if you would make your way forward for the offering. Um, again, uh, just think of Pastor as you're uh, at home and, and you pray. Think of him because he has a... Uh, Doing with dealing with seasonal allergies, and that's that's not a pretty thing at all. Uh, Brother Mike, could you pray for tonight's offering, please? Man, thank you. If you'll take your songbooks, please turn to hymn number 224. 224, please, in your songbooks. We'll do all three verses of hymn 224. Verse 1. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure mingling toil with peace and rest. Number two, every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As thy days thy strength shall be in measure, this the pledge to me he made. On the last, help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days are moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Amen. Grab your Bibles and open them up to John chapter 21. John chapter 21, the last book, the last chapter in the book of John. The last chapter in the book of John. 
John chapter 21. I don't know if it was already announced that pastor's out sick, but I'm pretty sure you guys figured that out with me running up to the platform one way or another, right? John chapter 21. This is one of my favorite stories here in Scripture. I really, really love this story. We'll start off in verse 9, um, go down to verse 14. Really, though, we'll, we'll start truly getting the story after verse 15 through 22. So John chapter 21, starting off in verse 9, we'll stand for the Word of God as our habit is. If you're able to, if you'll stand with me as we read the Word of God. It says, As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring her the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fish, and hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. Now this was the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. Let's pray, and let's have a little campfire chat with Christ tonight. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. First, we want to stop and again pray for Pastor. You'd help him to feel better. You, you'd help him just to physically get well. I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we look at this passage of Scripture, that we would be challenged tonight through the chat, little campfire chat you had with your disciples. We pray, Lord God, that you would help me to clearly and distinctively declare your word. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Praising your name. Amen. You may be seated. Growing up as a kid, we went camping a lot. I don't think, as far as I can remember back, I don't actually remember staying in a hotel until I was like a late teenager after my mom and st my dad and stepmom, Carrie, had gotten married and she kind of put a stop to those kind of things, right? As a kid, we went camping all the time. It was a, almost like a ritual that we would do, a passageway of when you hit the second grade to be able to go on this big hike with us the week after Labor Day every year. It's a three-mile hike in the, in the high Sierras up to Chickenfoot Lake. You had to jump in a lake made out of glacier water. It was, I mean, that, that was like a rite of passage for us growing up. I loved going camping as a kid. And one of my favorite parts of camping is sitting by the campfire. At the end of the day, you're kind of exhausted right from the hike. You, you're there at the campfire. It's getting late. It's beautiful out there. And it makes you kind of reflective. It makes you very meditative, doesn't it? I love those times out there camping several, several times doing that as a kid. And as we think about this story, that's kind of where they're at now. They're sitting around the campfire. To bring those who don't know the story off the top of their head back up to speed, this is the third time that Jesus saw his disciples after he rose from the grave. First two times were up in the upper room. First time, Thomas wasn't there. Second time, there he was. Um, Thomas was there. That's where you get Thomas falling down, saying a great verse, my Lord and my God. And after that, Peter... Kind of got depressed, didn't he? he? He kind of gave up. He had oh, one time with a great disciple, but then three times he denied even knowing Jesus. The third time, cussing the guy out. It says cursing and swearing. Um, he was the, one of the first people there at the cave, at the, the tomb, but after a couple of days, he realized he blew it gave up and turned to the disciples and says, you know what, guys? I go a-fishing. I give up. I'm going to go back to my old job. Seven of the other disciples said, we also go with thee. By the way, quick little side note. If you were to give up on church, if you were to stop coming, who would you take out with you? Peter quit, and seven of the other disciples quit with him. If you quit church, who else would quit with you? You gave up on God. Who else would you take down with you? They went fishing that night, these professional fishers, and they caught nothing. Not a fish. Suddenly, a stranger shows up on the shores and says, Children, have you any meat? No. Why don't you cast on the right side of the boat? I don't know how many of you have ever been fishing. 
But the left side or the right side really shouldn't matter that much, especially with a net, right? Throw it on the, throw it on the right side, and what happens? Oh, the mul it says they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. John suddenly gets a bright idea. That's the Lord. Yes, yes it is. Peter gets so excited, he jumps out of the boat and swims to Jesus. The other guys, you know, bring the boat in. And there is the campfire. Jesus has some fish already on there, has some bread, and tells them, why don't you guys come and dine? Let's have some dinner, breakfast probably by this time. They knew it was the Lord, and they were ready to hear what he had to say. I'm sure they were kind of scared as they knew they weren't supposed to be there, kind of nervous, almost expecting to get their face ripped. Are you familiar with that phrase? They're expe almost expecting to be chewed out. But instead, Jesus just simply asked them a couple questions. And tonight, as we look at these questions, I want to then reflect back to them, to put ourselves there at that campfire. And as Jesus asked these questions to Peter, let's also ask them to ourselves and look at these questions and apply them to our lives. The first thing that Jesus asked Peter, it says in verse 15, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? Well, he saith unto me, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. That's why I think he said it too, just kind of, yeah, yeah, Lord, you know I love thee. He saith unto them, Feed my lambs. Tonight I want to ask you, do you love God? Number one, do you love God more than stuff? Number one, more than stuff. Hey, making sure that was going to work right tonight. As they were sitting here, it's pretty obvious, you know, that around them would have been either fish or the bones of the fishes they just ate. Um, they brought in the 153 fish. I'm sure these guys didn't eat 153 fish. So they might have been smoking some more so they can have them later on. Getting mods right out some fish jerky, which does not sound appealing to me. So as they're sitting there surrounded by Peter's livelihood, by what made Peter money. And we know Peter was a pretty good fisherman. They had at least two boats and they had employees. So he was pretty good. He said, look, G Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this stuff? Do you love me more than these possessions? Do you love me more than stuff? And tonight I stop and ask you, do you love Christ more than you love stuff? possessions, materials, having a nice house, having a nice car. Let's see three principles to prove our love, if we really do love God. Three principles I want to help teach us real quick. First would be the principle of priority. What comes first in your life? What is the highest priority? What does your schedule say is your highest priority? Because so whatever that thing is, that's what you love the most. It is your highest priority. Of course, it makes me think of Mark 8, 36. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We know that no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. We can tell how important something is to you by what it takes to knock it off your schedule. Whatever is the higher priority, that become, that is what you love more. For example, if something's going on at church, I'm going to be there. I don't care what it is, I'm going to be there. That has been my principle for the last 13 years. Well, you're, you're a pastor, you're a preacher. Of course it is for you. This was before I was a pastor before I was a preacher, when I had a job at the storage units out there in Las Vegas, if something was going on at church, I was going to be there. I would show up Wednesday nights. I would show up. I would have to sit in the back with a metal folding chair because I was just covered in soot from working on those U-Haul vans. But I was going to be in church. Tuesday night visitation, I was there at church. We had an activity on Thursday nights. I was always there. Going back to when I was a kid, I mean, church was such a priority to me, I used to have to walk two miles to church. Uphill, both ways, in 100-degree weather, right? There, there's an overpass. But church was my priority. 
So I was going to make sure, even if I had to walk there, I was going to be there. How's Christ in your schedule? Is it something you'll squeeze in if there's time? Sometimes we have stuff in our schedule that really doesn't matter. I've been wanting to take Kiara up to do a special activity over at the Danbury Mall for about a month now. And stuff just keeps getting knocking off the schedule. I was planning going tomorrow. Somebody mentioned we're having a meeting Monday, so it got bumped because it's not really all that important. It's not a priority. Is Christ a priority in your schedule? Is he a priority? Y'all know what I'm going to talk about next. Of course, it's going to be the finances, right? Because you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, is, of course, there is a word for finances. Do you love Christ more than money? No, I don't. Well, then are you willing to skip church for a paycheck? Are you willing to miss a service so you can make more money? Well, then money is what you love more. It is whatever your priority is. It is your priority to make money. Well, then that's what you love more. Is it relaxing a higher priority than God? Is it more important to sleep in than be in Sunday school? 9.45. You shouldn't be in bed at 9.45 anyways, right? Is it your higher priority? Do you skip church to sleep in, to loaf around the house? Or do you get the true relaxation, the true rest which is in Christ? Uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. The principle of priority. What's the first thing on your schedule? Number two, the principle of placement. The principle of placement. The principle that placement of that putting God in the first place. Again, talking about tithe. Putting Christ first in your wallet. Again, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If I could look at your ledger, if I could look at your bank account, we can very easily figure out what's important, right? If you love Christ, you will be giving to the ministry. You will be giving first the tithe. The tithe is the first 10% of everything that you ha- that every increase that you get should go back to God. Sometimes liberal theologians say, well, that's an Old Testament thing. That's under the law. We don't have to do that. The Bible also says in the law, thou shalt not kill. we got to keep some things in the law. But also, the idea of a tithe way way precedes the law by hundreds of years. It's in the book of Genesis, Genesis 14, 20, it says that Abraham, and he gave tithes of all. We know this continues to the New Testament over in Hebrews chapter 7. If you really want to do a study, you can study it all out. As a Christian, we need to give the first 10% of any of the increase we get comes back to God through the local church in the tithe. What do we call someone, a Christian, that doesn't tithe? What does God call them? It's found in Malachi 3.8. I like playing with this one as I teach it to kids. It says, will a man rob God? Can you rob God? Of course, the kids are always like, no, you can't rob God. Yet ye have robbed me. They'll say, where and where have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. If you are a Christian and you are not giving that 10% to God, God says, you're a thief. You're robbing me. That is, God says, that is mine. And if we keep it back from God, we are robbing it from God. I don't want God to think I'm a thief. No, no, he has the first placement. He's going to get that first 10%. Secondly, it should be in our offering. If we're giving our tithe, and by the way, if you're not tithing, and you, need to, you say, I don't know what this tithing means, I, I need some more details, come and talk to me or one of the deacons afterwards. We'll kindly take the Bible and show you what the scripture of a tithe is. But as a Christian, we are to tithe. It is putting God in the first place. But we should also be giving an offering. The tithe is God. So the first 10%, the offering is how much we get to choose to give to him. It's our choice. So the first part is God. That's the law. We're supposed to do this. Then he gives us the opportunity to show him our love by giving of the offering. We get to choose how much and more, where did this go? I want to give this offering so people can go over to Taiwan and preach the gospel over in Taiwan. I want to give this offering so that we can take care of the physical building maintenance more. I want to give this offering so we can buy another bus or whatever it could be. An offering is a 
free choice that we get to make. And if we love something, we will spend money on it. It doesn't matter, say, we're talking about, of course, church, but we can look at any subject in your life, and you'll spend money on what's important to you. If photography is important to you, you'll spend money on a nice camera, right? If baseball is important to you, you'll spend money buying you know, souvenirs, buying hats, buying game tickets. If it's important to you, you'll spend money on it. If it's not important to you, you really don't. I don't really buy tickets to games because they're not important to me. What's important to you, you'll spend money on. But are we putting God first? Then I see the principle of possessions. Does God have control over all you have? For instance, can God ask you to you go use your car for his ministry? If Sunday morning pastor walked up to you and said, hey, jump in your car, I want you to go run down to the Fanny Crosby house over on Fairfield Avenue and go, go pick up this um, homeless person. We'd be like, well, no, no not in my car. He said, I don't want them to get something on my leather seats. Can God use your car for the ministry? Could God, would you let God use your house to like host a missionary for a week? Even if that means you had to move out of it for a week. Or is that, is that kind of off limits to God? Is that possession? No, no God, you can't use this. This, this, is, this is mine. Is it off limits to God? By the way, when something's off limits to God, it becomes then first in our lives. And that becomes our new God. Whether it's money, saying, well, God, I have to have this job. If it's possessions, well, God, I have to have this nice house. I couldn't, I couldn't give my house for a week for a missionary. I couldn't do that. Well, then that's becoming your God. It's taking the first place in your life. God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Whether it's money, and we're putting money first over coming to church, whether we're putting possessions. No, I couldn't, I couldn't give that to God. Hey, it could apply to skills. Do you have a skill that you're not using to serve the Lord with? We had a great example of this when we had the big display for the Eastern musical coming on, didn't we? We, we had a master carpenter come in here, cut out that really cool-looking cave. We had a master contractor assemble it all together. We had two professional artists, two professional art teachers come in here, a seamstress come in here and do all that work to make it look awesome. They gave what they could do to God. They let God use that skill. Is there a skill saying, God, I, I couldn't do that? And God, I, I couldn't let you use that. No, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, neither where do thieves do break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus asked Peter, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Is there a possession? Is there, do you love stuff more than you love God? Is it your highest priority? Say, so, I man, I am going to be there serving God as best as I can. Or is it going to be, can if it's in the schedule? Yeah, if I'm not doing anything else. I, I would be there, but I got work tonight. I would be there, but I, the NBA playoffs are going on. I would be there, but... No buts. Be there. Is it your highest priority? Is God your, is the principle of placement, are you putting God number one in your tithes, in your offering? Is he being placed high or is it just kind of in there? Yeah, I'll give when the offering plate comes, but I'll throw a couple of bucks in there. God's only worth a couple of bucks? No. It's a tithe. Don't rob God. And in our possessions, is there anything you have that, man, the God, that's off limits. You cannot touch they need a TV for the nursery. Oh, no, you can't have my TV. By the way, we don't need a TV for the nursery as an example. Um, whatever you have, is there something that say, God, you cannot use this? Then God says, then I cannot use you. Is God your highest priority? Or do you love him more than stuff? He said to Peter, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Is that how we're going to respond to Jesus? Yeah, Jesus, you know I love thee. Then feed my lambs. Verse 16, he saith unto them the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said, yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. You know, it's kind of interesting here. There's a little bit of a word difference between 15 and 16 when Jesus responds to him. Did you notice that? He asked, the first time he told him, go feed my lambs. Second time he says, feed my sheep. There's a difference, right? It's not the same word. 
Is that a mess up in the Bible? No, it's actually very interesting. When I think of the word sheep, and it ain't to me, it makes me think of a shepherd. Of course, we think, we think of a shepherd, or you think about being an under-shepherd, being a pastor, as we use the term nowadays. As we know, in the Bible, there's several terms for the word pastor. You could also call a bishop, you know, Bishop Levine. Sounds kind of weird. Um, we use the term elder, Elder Levine. I'm already feeling old enough just turning 30, so let's... let's um, several of you rolled your eyes, right? Um, there's the term presbyter. No, 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 I like the term pastor. Um, the under-shepherd, though, is another scriptural term for it, another term showing that you are the shepherd of this flock. Makes me think of Matthew 16, 18, where God calls Peter, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter, of course, we know, becomes one of the first pastors in history. So when he says to them, you know, feed my sheep, makes me think Jesus was telling Peter, hey, I want you to serve. Peter, do you love me enough to serve? Number two, to serve. Peter, do you love me enough to serve? Number one, in soul winning. God has already called you to be a soul winner. Oh, if God would just call me, I would do it. He's already called you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go ye into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Um, Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Acts 1, 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. God has already called you to go and be a witness of him. As he says over in um, John 20, just a couple of verses back, John 20, 21, Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. So it's not a matter of, does God want me to be a soul winner? Yes. Yes, he does. God has called you time and time again in his word to go out there and tell other people how they can have salvation. So it's not a matter of, God, do you want me to do it? Yes, yes, he does. The question then is, why aren't you? If, you, if you're not, why aren't you? Why are you or why aren't you? A verse that I read the other day that got me really convicted was over in Mark 8, 38. It says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and this sinful generation, am I ashamed to talk about Christ? Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory with his Father and the holy angels. It's not a matter of, does God want you to be a soul winner? Because yes, yes, he does. I could go on the long spiel naming verses after verse after verse, proving that God has called you to be a soul winner. To, to, it shows you that God has called you to go out there and teach other people how they can have a home in heaven. The question is, why aren't we? Why aren't we? Do, do we love him enough? Do, do we love him enough to come out on a Saturday morning to go visit on the bus routes? Do we love him enough to come out on a Tuesday night and make a visit for him? To go knock on our door and, hey, man, we're glad you came to church. Or, no, we don't really love God enough. No, nah, my favorite TV show is on. I like that show more than I like serving God. Do you love God enough to serve him? Do you love God enough to serve him by soul winning? Do we love God enough to serve him in sitting? In sitting, that's a weird phrase. I don't just mean sitting in the pew. I mean sitting with those, like the father and widows over in James 1.27. Pure religion, undefiled before God the Father is this, to, to visit the fatherless and the widows in the day of their affliction. When I think about that, do we love God enough to go sit with the widow, the elderly, or at the nursing homes? We at this church have a great ministry for, for, to ministering to widows. It's a nursing home ministry. Every Sunday, they go out, they'll go into several, the three to four different nursing homes in the community, and they'll go, and they'll talk to these people. They'll talk to these who are, just can't physically anymore make it to church. Can you imagine what it must feel like to be trapped? Think about this. It's a secured location being told what they can do and when they can do it, not even being able really to choose in most places what they have to eat when, or when, when they can eat, rarely getting visitors and basically waiting for the day of their death. That sounds like prison, doesn't it? And yet in America, we'll put people all the time 
in these nursing homes, and most Americans would just leave their parents there and forget about them. I was laughing, thinking about it today. It's like, man, we want to say older people have Alzheimer's. These, these seniors have Alzheimer's, but really it's almost like the kids forgetting about where they put their parents, rarely going and visiting them. No, if we are going to be a servant of God, we need to go and start serving the widows. If you haven't ever gone out to the nursing home ministry, you need to go visit it. If we, even if we have everybody go out there this Sunday, that won't be a problem, right, Brother Shagru? <laughs> you need to go out there and see this with your own eyes, to see these people, to talk to them, to get to know them. Well, I want to know what to do. Sit with them. Have a conversation with them. Talk to them. Get to know them. Love on them. Christ want, would want you to. The Bible says over in Matthew 25, and verse 34, Then say the king to them in his right hand, Come ye blessed of the Father, and inherit the kingdom which is prepared from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. And I was in prison, and ye came unto me. That kind of sounds like the nursing home ministry right there, right? Being sick and having someone come visit you. We said a second ago, it sound, a lot of nursing homes treat the people almost like a prison. The people turn to Jesus and say in verse 39, well, when, shall we say, when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Then the king shall say unto them, And so much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Do you love God enough to serve him by sitting with a widow? By sitting in the nursing home? How about by sitting on the bus? Coming out on Saturdays, going visiting with us for the bus. On Sunday, jumping on the bus with us to go bring those in. If you want to see a generation toward, towards God, to truly see an impact in the child's life, I'll see you on the bus. If you want to see a life change, to show love to those who are often ignored, discriminated against, and looked down on, jump on the bus. Come and serve on the bus. Many of the children on the bus, I know we have some of the bus kids in here, they live in families where they are fatherless. The, parent, the dad's not in the home, being raised by either a family and uncle and mom by herself. Why don't you come and visit the fatherless then on the bus with us? The bus will leave here every week. You can simply jump on. Well, I want to know what to say. How about hi? How about my name is? What's your name? Oh, I want to know what to say. Start loving on them. Say, Jesus loves you. That's all I know to say, but Jesus loves you. Good. For whosoever shall give a cup of water to drink in my name, because he belonged to Christ, verily I shall say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Mark 9.41. Mark 9, Do you love Jesus enough to serve him in sitting, in soul winning? How about in speaking? Do you love Christ enough to serve him in your speech, what you're talking about? Again, we talk about soul winning, but I'm thinking about ministering to the saints. Um, Ephesians 4, uh, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good for the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. When was the last time you used your words to show someone the love of Christ? Are we taking the time to minister to the brethren in the church and teach them and show them the edifying love of Christ? Or at the end of church, is it all just catching up, chit-chatting, you know? Or are you trying to build somebody up? During our missions conference, I really got kind of challenged during the mission conference to start writing letters to our missionaries. Just, I, so I started shooting them emails. It has been so amazing. By the way, do, why don't you do the same? Their emails, a lot of them are back that are on the board, so it's easy enough to do. I can shoot you a copy of their emails, too, if you want. I'll shoot them texts. I'll shoot them emails saying, hey, just want to show you, you're the missionary of the week. We're going to take extra time this week to pray for you. I'll get back some emails, and it's just like, wow, they're really praying for us. I got one from Brother Eberly a couple hours ago saying, hey, man, I'm so glad you're praying for us. This Sunday, we're supposed to meet in a new building, and we don't have it secured yet. Will you guys pray for us that we can get this building secure so we can start this new church? By the way, let's pray for him. If he's trying to start this new church, that he can actually be in the building Hey, it's, we say quick response. I send a response saying, yes, we will be praying. Can we serve people to this week in our speech to be an encouragement to them, to edify them, to build them up? 
Is this going to be the chit chat? Do we love Christ enough to serve him in soul winning, to, to serve him in sitting on the bus in the nursing homes? Do we love God enough to serve him by our speech, by what we're saying? Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Well, feed my sheep. I got a job for you to do. Finally, tonight, we get to the hard passage, the last time he asked the question. This part, though, should kind of make us squirm a little bit. Because the next one is very pointed in verse 17. He says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? <sighs> Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. He said unto them, Well, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou was young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest wherever thou wouldest, even wherever you wanted. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hand, and another shall gird thee, and carries thee whither thou wouldest not. This he spake, this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken it, he said unto Peter, he said unto him, follow me. Peter, are you willing, do you love me enough to suffer? Do you love me enough to suffer? Before Jesus went to the cross, he told his disciples, one of you is going to betray me. No, we would never betray thee. In fact, Peter even says over in Matthew 26, 35, or 33 says, Though all men should be, be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. What did Jesus say unto them? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said, no, no, no. Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise said all his disciples. And what happened? He denied Jesus. Oh my, I will die for you, Jesus. Hours later, he start, after he cuts off Malchus's ears, Peter fails to love Jesus three times. Tonight. I know not the man. I, I, I don't know the man. I don't understand what you're saying. The third time it says that he turned around and started cussing them out. It uses the term. In Matthew 26, 74, then he began to curse and to swear, saying that I know not the man. And immediately the clock crew. Jesus, although I will die for you. A couple hours later, I don't, I don't, I don't know him. That's so when Jesus asked, said, look, do you love me enough to suffer? Because if you follow me, you will. Because you were, when you were a kid, you wouldn't do what you wanted. But when you're old... They're going to take that with what it's not. Peter, you said you would die for me before. Do you really love me that much? Tonight, I want to stop and ask, do we love Christ that much? Do we love Christ enough to step out and trust and say, God, I'm going to follow you. God, I will suffer for you. God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to step out and trust, even if it scares me. Even if I have to suffer, are we willing to step out to sell your house, pack your bags, and move to Afghanistan, move to Iraq to become a, to become a missionary? I mean, I couldn't do that. They might kill me over there. Are you willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? Luke 14, 26, if any man will come to me, and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and also his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Do we love Christ more than we love even our own family? Do we love Christ enough more than even our own lives? I can't suffer for Jesus. Then you don't really love him enough. You're not one of his disciples. 
I, I couldn't do that. Then you don't love Christ enough. I was thinking about today in, in, in America, so many of us are afraid of Muslim extremists, aren't we? There's all this talk about them. And we, we think about here in Connecticut, New Haven is one of those sanctuary cities where they took in thousands and thousands of refugees. And we're, some people are afraid, oh, what, what if we need attack here? Well, there is a way to stop any Muslim extremist attack. You know that, right? It's to win them for the Lord. But too often, we get just too afraid. We see someone wearing one of the, um, I wrote the names down. I'm not even going to try to pronounce those names. We see them wearing those headdresses. We see them rocking down towards the mosques. And I can't talk to them. What if, what if they do something about, to, to me? Then you don't love Christ enough. You don't love Christ more than your own life. He said, you cannot be my disciple. But, but they could hurt me. Yeah, well, the cross hurt a lot more. Having our sins put on him hurt a lot more. But, but what, if, what, what, what could they do unto me? Well, the Lord is on my side. Whom shall I fear? What can man do unto me? Psalm 118.6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The wicked flee when no man pursueth. Proverbs 28.1 says, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Are we willing to even suffer for Christ? Or is it, no, I can't do that. Are we willing to even step out of our comfort zones to suffer for him? To, okay, God might, what if God called you to sell your 401k and give that money to the church? Oh, I couldn't do that. Then you love it more than God. But, what, but I, I need that. Okay, well, are you willing to suffer? But my life, I, I need that for retirement. Yes. But are you willing to suffer for him? Are you willing to step out and do something solely by faith? For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. For, he is, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are you willing to step out in faith and obey him, even if it's not comfortable, even if it hurts, if you have to suffer for him? Are you willing, do you love Christ enough to sit and to suffer for him, to step out in faith? Now, when Jesus looked at Peter and said, are you willing to step out and suffer for me? Peter, in turn, said something kind of funny. This would not be my first response by someone saying, hey, this is how you're going to die. He says in verse 20, then Peter turned to the disciple to whom Jesus loveth, following, which also leaned at the leaned at supper and said, Lord, who's it to betray these? It, talking about John. He was identifying it was John, okay? So he turned around and saw John. Peter saith unto him, Jesus, well, what did he do instead? What, what shall this man do? Okay, God, if you're going to have me die, what's, what's, what are you make him do? Jesus said unto him, what if I tear, what if I will that he tear me till I come? What is that to thee? Why is it any of your business what I got for him to do? Follow thou me. Follow thou me. If we're going to suffer for Christ, we need to stay on track. Too often we get distracted. We'll turn around and we'll look at other people. We'll see what they're doing, what's in their lives. And if we're looking at other people, well, then we're no longer looking at Christ. If we're comparing our Christian walk with somebody else's Christian walk, then you're not looking at Christ. If I'm watching you and what you're doing, then I'm not looking at him. We need to make sure we're keeping our eyes focused on Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. God has a plan for each of our lives. So we don't need to go worry about what someone else's plan is, for their, God's plan for their life is. We have to worry about what we're doing how we are following Christ. Growing up, my little brothers, Adam and Jimmy, they used to race motocross. They were really good. They actually went professional. That was back in the days of Jeremy McGrath and everything. And they traveled the country as professional motocross racers. Personally, I prefer four wheels. I was up at Willow Springs racetrack racing there. I couldn't look at my brothers and say, well, you're not as good as a racer as I am. We were in two totally different races. They were in motocross. I was doing drift, was my sport. 
we're in two different sports. How can I compare myself to them? How can I compare Michael Jordan and Jackie Robinson? How good of an athlete they were. They weren't playing the same sport. How can I compare your Christian race and my Christian race? It's a different race. But he's not as far along as I am. God has a different course for them. But when I was that old, I was doing this. No, no, no. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We d- for we dare not to make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Peter is looking at John saying, well, what will John, what will he do? Jesus says, look, follow thou me. I got a plan for your life. You need to stay on target. Stay on track and be straight on target. Look, Peter, follow thou me. Follow thou me. Let's be straight on target. What's the target? Christ. Look, um, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. If our eyes are on Jesus, we will run, uh, we will run our race on a straight target instead of trying to compare ourselves to someone else. Again, if I'm looking at Brother B, then I'm not looking at Jesus. I'm looking at him. doesn't make sense. We need to stay on target. We need to concentrate on what the Savior did for us. And if we concentrate, if we stay on target, we'll be willing to suffer for him. No matter what that is, whether it's moving to another country to go preach for Christ in a place that could get us killed, or whether it's stopping working on Sundays so we can actually be here in church. If we are focused on Christ, we will be, have a, we'll be straight on target, and we will show God we're willing to suffer for him. The Apostle Paul did a great job of keeping his eyes on Christ. He said in Acts 20:24, 20, But none of those things move me, neither count I my own life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel, of his, the, gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. If we're keeping our eyes focused on Christ, if we're stretching for the nail-scarred hands, if we're seeing God, what, I am looking at you. I want to be closer to you. I want to do what you want me to do. We'll be willing to suffer anything for the name of Jesus. We'll be willing to do whatever it takes to please our Lord, even if it causes pain, even if it causes suffering, because we'll be looking at the suffering of Christ and saying, like they said in Luke 17.10, so likewise ye, when you should have done all those things which are commanded of you, you'll say, well, man, we're some profitable servants. We've, we've done that, which was our duty to do. We'll say, Jesus, none of the suffering was worth it. I'm, just, I'm a worthy unservant just trying to serve you. Are we willing to suffer for him? Or, man, I don't know, Jesus, if I love you that much. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Uh, thou knowest I love Thou knowest all things, Jesus. Thou knowest I love thee. Okay, here's the plan. You're going to end up dying for me. One, day, one time you did say you would be willing to die for me. And you end up running scared. This time, are you willing to die for me? Legend has it. We, we, know, we know Peter died for sure as he was serving God. Legend, history has it, that it was in AD 68. He was actually in Rome and got on the wrong side of um, Emperor Nero. And Emperor Nero truly was a vicious dude. He used to love um, lighting the way to Rome by taking people, dipping them in oil, and lighting them on fire. He was a vicious man. So when the apostle Peter was there, he determined that, okay, Peter, you love Jesus so much, you love preaching about the cross so much, you're going to die on a cross then. You want to be like Jesus? I'll kill you just like how Jesus was killed. And the day of his execution, Peter said, 
I'm not worthy to even die in the same manner as Jesus. How about instead you flip me upside down and I die upside down so I'm not in the same manner as Christ? Legend says that he died upside down on the cross because he, wasn't even, he didn't think himself good enough to die even in the same manner as Jesus did. I look at that and says, you know what? I think he was willing to suffer for Christ. We go through the book of Acts and we see what Peter's willing to do and it says, yeah. You know what, Peter? Lovest thou me more than these? When we get through the book of Acts, yeah, I think Peter did. I think he turned his back on the possessions. I think Jesus became his priority. I think he was willing to give up his possessions. He was willing to, he truly loved Jesus more than these. Do we? Do we love Jesus more than stuff? Whatever thing that is? Is there anything that Jesus couldn't have in your life? Is there any, is Jesus the number one priority? Or is he just kind of in there, we'll do it when I can, when I can work it around? Does Peter, did Peter, do you love me enough? To, do you love me? Yeah, well, go feed my sheep. I think Peter did a good job doing that, being the apostle to the Jews and really being the one to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He, yeah, I would say he loved God, Jesus enough to serve. Do we love Jesus enough to serve him? To serve him in our sitting, to be able to come out, and whether it's through the nursing home ministry, the bus ministry, and to sit down to serve God and to serve his... Do we love God enough to serve him through soul winning? Do we love him enough to suffer? Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. You know everything, Jesus. Okay, then you're going to die. You're going to follow me into the day that they kill you. Are you willing to follow me? History says that, yeah, Peter really was, that he was sold out, that he was willing to suffer for the name of Jesus. Are we willing to suffer for his name? Whether it cost us our comfort, if it cost us physically, if it cost us to have to sell our home to move to another part of the world, are we willing to suffer? Or are we too concentrated on someone else? Well, what about that guy? Why hasn't he done it yet? Well, he has more money than me. He can do that. No, no, no. Follow thou me. Stay straight on target. Do you love Christ enough to suffer for his name? Tonight, as I open up the altar call, I, I invite you to stand with me. I want to challenge you to come down to the altar tonight and to tell Jesus how much he means to you. As I close in a word of prayer, why don't you come down to the altar tonight and tell him, Jesus, I do love you enough to serve, to suffer. Jesus, I do love you more than stuff. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just do want to tell you that we love you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that our actions would be, speak louder than just our words, that we would truly show you that we love you more than stuff, that we love you more than our possessions, that you are our first priority. Lord Jesus, that there is nothing that is you cannot have in our lives. Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord God, that we would show you in our lives that we love you enough to serve you. Through whether it's serving in soul winning and going out there and telling people that you, just like you've called us to do, to go out there and, and serve you through soul winning, through sitting in the nursing homes or sitting on the buses, Lord Jesus, or serving you however you would call us to do. Lord Jesus, and I pray that we here would truly be willing to suffer for your name's sake. Not just looking at everybody else, well, they have a worse, or this person doing that, but we would stay on target and willing to suffer and even die if you needed us to, for your glory. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Praise things your name. Amen. So we stand to our feet for the altar call, and I know we don't have a piano tonight, but take some time. I would challenge you. Why don't you come down to the altar tonight and just tell Jesus how much he means to you. Why don't you talk to Jesus for a second and tell him that you do love him, you know, only five people in the Bible ever told Jesus. We only see in five spots in the entire scripture of people saying, I love you, God. And one of them is here in the scripture where Jesus had to specifically ask. 
why don't you come down to the altar tonight and just tell him yourself, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you enough to do whatever you want me to do.